Hello and thanks for joining us on this Sunday evening for our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Korea and Japan held working level talks at the long un un unresolved issue of Japan's wartime sexual slavery system just today ahead of the ministerial level meeting that's also set to take place in Korea. We now connect to our Kwon so at Seoul's Foreign Min Affairs Ministry for details. So, uh, less than two weeks ago, the country's 11th meeting on the wartime sex slavery issue ended with uh, no tangible outcome. Were there some positive developments this time around? Hi, Daniel. Well, expectations were higher than before after Japanese Prime Minister Abe's sudden decision on Friday to send his uh, um, Thursday, that is, to send his foreign minister Fumio Kishida to Korea to hold talks with his Korean counterpart Yoon byung se on Monday. But today's meeting was the 12th director general level meeting since April last year. Uh, it ended less than an hour ago, and Korea's representative to the talks, the foreign ministry's Northeast Asian bureau chief Lee sang Dok, and his Japanese counterpart Kim Hiro Ishikane, were said to have met for around two hours on the agenda for tomorrow's talks, and no details have been released yet. But uh, let's hear what Foreign Minister Yoon byung se said earlier today about tomorrow's talks. The negotiations on the topic are accelerating more than ever before, especially after the Korea-Japan summit last month. I think the timing of Foreign Minister Kishida's visit and the ministerial talks is of great importance. Well, so for tomorrow's meeting, can we keep alive our hopes for an agreement? Uh, Daniel, there has been speculation about a breakthrough in the wake of Japan's reaction to two recent court decisions in Korea. A court in Seoul cleared a Japanese reporter of defaming Korean President Park geun and Korea's constitutional court dismissed a complaint by a Korean woman against the constitutionality of a 1965 bilateral treaty. But on the Korean side, there have been doubts about Japan's sincerity, especially after Japanese media reports on Japan's Japan's attempt to move a symbolic comfort woman statue away from the Japanese embassy in Seoul. According to Seoul, that is not an option at all. Also, there has been no change in Korea and Japan's basic stances. Seoul wants a formal apology and compensation from the Japanese government to the comfort women, and Tokyo says it wants to approach the issue on a humanitarian level, meaning some form of compensation could be offered to the women, but it would not come from the government. So we will have to see and uh, see what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, that's all I have for now. I'll have more updates in our later newscast. Daniel? Thank you for those updates. So uh, staying on the topic, it's a race against time given the age of some of the survivors of Japan's wartime sex slavery system. They're mostly in their 80s and 90s. That's why a group of 10 of them is urging Japan to open a compensation case. They are seeking compensation of 100 million won or roughly 85,000 U.S. dollars each from the Japanese government. Kim Gang-won, who represents the women, filed a document with a Korean court on the issue last week. The request follows several previous attempts as Japan has thus far refused to accept the case. There were originally 12 women listed as conflict complainants, but two have died since the first document was filed back in 2013. Shifting gears now, Korea could soon see a drop in its growth potential due to its rapidly aging population. That's according to Yi Chang-yong, director of the IMF's Asia and Pacific Department, who spoke to Seoul Bay up News Agency on Sunday. He said Asia's fourth largest economy needs to revive its econ economic dynamics rather to achieve sustainable growth. To prevent chronic low growth, he suggested structural reforms in childbirth, health care, education and the service sector in the mid and long term. If the timing of the reforms is missed, Korea could go the way of Japan and see its growth potential drop to 0.5 percent over the next decade or two. On a more positive note, he says Korea's fundamentals are strong enough to overcome the current financial difficulties, citing Moody's recent upgrade of Korea's sovereign credit rating to AA2, the third highest and higher than those of Japan and China. The Bank of Korea has released its report card on consumer spending for the third quarter, and although the country's consumption has been flagging, spending on medical devices has increased markedly. A recovery from the MERS outbreak earlier this year has been cited as the main reason. Kwon jang takes a look at the numbers. Koreans spent 8.7 billion U.S. dollars on medical services in the third quarter this year. 
That's a 7.5% increase than the same period last year, and almost three times more than the average increase in consumer spending. It's also double the amount spent eight years ago in the third quarter of 2007. The Bank of Korea, which released the numbers in a report on Sunday, said the increase is mainly due to people venturing back to hospitals after the outbreak of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in May. Spending on medical care in the first three quarters of the year was also up 6.6% due to greater spending on elder care and an increase in medical tourism. Spending on elder care has gone up by over 11% in the first half of the year, while spending on medical tourism has also increased by almost 5%. About 280,000 foreigners made the trip to Korea, with customers from China making up the largest group at about 30 percent. Meanwhile, consumer spending as a whole saw an average growth of just 2.6 percent. Food and drink expenditures went up just over 5 percent, while transport went up by 3. Spending on clothing and education was down around 2 and 1 percent, respectively. The only other significant increase was to alcohol and tobacco spending, which was up almost 30 percent. But that was due to an increase in the tobacco tax in January that almost doubled the price of cigarettes. Kwon Jang Woo, Arirang News. The Korean government's cigarette price hike, part of various anti smoking measures, is proving to be ineffective. According to the Korea Tax Internet, an activist group for taxpayers' rights, the tax is unfair and unsustainable as it taxes low income earners instead of people in higher income brackets. Analysts say tobacco companies are in fact attracting more young customers with new high end products. Korea Tax Internet adds the tax, which raised cigarette prices from two U.S. dollars per pack to four, did increase tax revenue from cigarette sales to around 9.4 billion dollars from January to December, up by around 64 percent from the same period last year. Earnings results from the nation's most dominant tobacco company, KTNG, show sales dipped temporarily, but then recovered with its net profit jumping 55 percent in the January to June period compared to the same period last year. Korea was the world's largest buyer of military weapons last year. That's according to a New York Times report citing the United States Congressional Research Service. Korea reportedly spent 7.8 billion U.S. dollars on weaponry in 2014, 90 percent of which was purchased from the United States, including unmanned spy planes and transport helicopters. Iraq was the second largest importer, spending $7.3 billion on weapons on its ongoing efforts to build up its military after the withdrawal of American forces. Brazil came in third, spending $6.5 billion. The U.S. was the largest exporter of weapons, selling over half of all weapons brought by other, country, other countries, rather, bringing in revenue of $36 billion. Roughly 1.5 million soldiers are stationed at military bases along the inter-Korean border to keep the country safe, even during the holidays. But what's to keep them from getting homesick? Kim Yeon bin visited a general outpost on the border to see how the troops spent their holidays. All able-bodied men in Korea are required to serve mandatory military service for 21 months. And during that time, most of the holidays are spent in barracks. To provide the troops with a more homely atmosphere, numerous additions have been made to general outposts, or GOPs, dotted along the inner Korean border. From a PC zone to weight room, the military has provided recreational facilities to boost morale and ensure the young men don't get too homesick. But the sad truth is that Korea remains the only divided country in the world. A military demarcation line stretching 250 kilometers splits the Korean peninsula in two. Soldiers at the GOP remain on high alert while the rest of us enjoy the festivities. They'll continue monitoring for any unusual activities north of the border so we can rest easy and enjoy the holiday atmosphere. Our ancestors made an endless effort to defend the Republic of Korea. We will do the same. Troops on the border are trained to be prepared for the worst case scenario. Day and night, they scour the border for signs of unusual activities or breaches. We have the mentality to destroy any enemy forces while maintaining our highest defense readiness. At night, the border is pitch black, so night surveillance equipment has been installed across the border to help troops spot what the naked eye can't. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News, Yeoncheon. 
An audio message by a man claiming to be Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi appeared on ISIS-related social media on Saturday. The speech appears to be directed toward ISIS fighters in an attempt to boost their spirits in the face of recent major battlefield setbacks. He also challenged the U.S. and its European and Arab allies to confront his group on the ground in Iraq and Syria. He went on to promise a battle aimed at Israel and in support of Palestine. There has still been no confirmation that the message was from Baghdadi. Islamic State has lost significant ground in both Iraq and Syria in recent weeks and months as the U.S. and its European allies intensify their airstrikes, provide support for local ground forces in Iraq and Syria, with Russia now also targeting Islamic State. About a year ago, a U.S. poll showed that Americans close out 2014 on an optimistic note, with nearly half predicting the year to come would be even better than the last. That was then. This is now. This year's poll by the Associated Press Times Square Alliance reveals 57 percent said this year was worse than last for the world as a whole. Only 10 percent said this year was better, while 32 percent think there wasn't much difference. 68 percent said the key reason for their negative response was the string of mass shootings, including the attacks in San Bernardino and Paris. Others mentioned the Islamic State group atrocities and the Iran nuclear deal, the U.S. presidential race, the Paris Climate Change Conference, the Supreme Court's legalization of gay marriage, and the Cuba-U.S. thaw also made the list. More than 95 percent said they would rather watch New Year's Eve events on TV at home due to security concerns. And now for a quick look at the weather before we go. If you're in Korea, bundle up and think function over form so you don't mind looking like a puffy marshmallow when you put on that winter coat. On Monday, Seoul will start the day at minus 9 degrees Celsius. Chuncheon will be a bone chilling minus 11. And Daejeon and Cheongju will be at minus 6. The mercury will rise to zero later in the day in Seoul, to one in Chuncheon and to three and two in Daejeon and Cheongju. And now let's check out the weather conditions outside of Korea around the world. And that's all for now. Do tune in at 10 p.m. Korea time for more. For now, thanks for watching.